All it takes for you to accept Jesus Christ is simple faith. It doesn't take works. It's not about doing anything, but rather it is simply believing. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And everlasting means everlasting, means forever. What, what salvation requires that you believe is that you must believe instead of working for this salvation, that he has done what needs to be done. We receive it. As many as received him who believed in his name. So as you can see in today's presentation of the gospel, people are simply told to believe in Jesus or even worse, believe on Jesus without really a clear idea of what that even means. The Old Testament might give us a clue when it talks about faith in reference to Moses. So in Exodus 14, the people put their faith in Yahweh, in the God of Israel, and in his servant Moses. Now I put the Greek translation there of the Hebrew just to show you later on that in the New Testament, the same word is used for Jesus. Behold, I will come to you in a thick cloud, so that the people may hear when I speak with you, and may also believe in you forever. So again, this is the God of Israel, Yahweh, speaking to his servant, Moses. What God is simply saying here is people need to believe in everything Moses says and does, because he's the personal representative of God. In the same way, really, in the New Testament when it comes to Jesus, so that all might believe through Jesus, and as you can see there, it's the same Greek word, the same translation of the Hebrew. John baptized people so they would turn to God, but he also told them someone else was coming and they should put their faith in him. So in a way, modern-day evangelicalism, exemplified by the late Billy Graham, who said that faith is rationally impossible where there's nothing to believe and that faith must have an object. But Billy Graham and many others are sadly giving people a part of that faith because they limit it to a belief or a faith on Jesus' death and resurrection only. But Jesus, when he says, believe in me, he's telling us to believe in something. So what is that exactly? It's Jesus' message, which the New Testament calls the gospel as good news. So a good starting place is Mark 1. Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming God's gospel and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is approaching. Repent and believe in the gospel, that is, about the coming kingdom. This is important not only as a purpose statement of Jesus, but because these were the first words recorded out of the mouth of Jesus himself. In Luke 4.43, Jesus gives us his agenda. I must proclaim the gospel about the kingdom of God to the other cities also. That's the reason for which I was commissioned or sent. So just like his cousin, the baptizer, John, Jesus was sent, was commissioned to warn people about the coming kingdom of God that was at hand, that is imminent. And by the way, it's always at hand. In the Old Testament prophets, going back to maybe a thousand years before them, before John the Baptist and Jesus, they're always talking about the imminence of the gospel, that the gospel is at hand, and you can find that in Ezekiel and so on. So a modern-day example of how bereft of what believe on Jesus means would be voting. For example, we're flooded with ad campaigns and so on, and we're told to believe on a particular politician. So can you imagine you're just told to vote, just vote for whoever it is at the expense of knowing anything about not only who they are, but what they represent and what their actual campaign policies are. That obviously would be ludicrous. Now let's finish with this. What is the kingdom of God then? So what is this thing that was important to Jesus that was his purpose statement, his mission in life. When they had gathered together, they asked Jesus, the apostles, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? 
the NABRE, the New American Bible Revised Edition, has a good footnote on this verse. The question of the disciples implies that in believing Jesus to be the Christ, they had expected him to be a political leader who would restore self-rule to Israel during his historical ministry. As Savior, the Anointed One of God, Jesus is also looked upon as the one who rescues humanity from sin and delivers humanity from the condition of alienation from God. Another good question to ask is, so what happens in this kingdom that's coming? First and foremost, the resurrection of God's people from all the ages to govern the nations. Jesus marveled at the faith of the soldier, a Gentile, and Jesus said to those who were following him, Truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. I say to you that many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Obviously, Jesus is not talking about going to heaven to have a banquet with the patriarchs, but he's referencing the fact that Judaism believed in a resurrection of the dead. Now, what happens in the kingdom, according to Jesus in Revelation 2, he says, I will give power over the nations to everyone who wins the victory and keeps on obeying me until the end. They will govern nations and rule over peoples with iron scepters and shatter them like pottery. Another important aspect of what happens in the kingdom is peace on earth and goodwill towards everyone. So we have in Isaiah this incredible vision of this future kingdom and what will happen. Yahweh, that is the God of Israel, will mediate between nations and will settle international disputes. They will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will no longer fight against nation nor train for war anymore. But the souls of the righteous are in the hand of God, and no torment will ever touch them. In the eyes of the foolish they seem to have died, and their departure was thought to be an affliction, and their going from us to be their destruction, but they are at peace. For though in the sight of men they were punished, their hope is full of immortality. Having been disciplined a little, they will receive great good, because God tested them and found them worthy of himself. Like gold in the furnace he tried them, and like a sacrificial burnt offering he accepted them. In the time of their visitation they will shine forth, and will run like sparks through the stubble. They will govern nations and rule over peoples, and the Lord will reign over them forever. Those who trust in him will understand truth, and the faithful will abide with him in love, because grace and mercy are upon his elect, and he watches over his holy ones.